We provided him with a room in the London Hospital. And he lived there, I think, in relative peace until he died. When I saw the face for the first time, that's something I would rather forget, and I put it to the back of my mind because I was almost physically sick. And as a trained and experienced nurse, one is not proud of that. One has seen accidents, one has seen terrible sights, but this was something quite indescribable. One could not help but being deeply affected by this case, this particular case, because here was a man we could have turned away. And here was someone that indeed we could help. He was incurable. But that doesn't mean to say you can't help people. John Merrick lived for three years at the London Hospital. Dr. Treves visited him often, constantly bringing books which opened up a magic world of make-believe to his patient, who began to construct miniatures which he proudly presented to visitors. He must have had the most horrific mental troubles to bear, knowing what he looked like. I believe that his coming into our hospital helped not only himself, but all those around us. It widened our own experience. It certainly widened mine. And in the end, I felt rather ashamed of my initial reaction. The circumstances of John Merrick's death were a little puzzling to us at the time. You see, John Merrick, because of the size of his head, had to sleep sitting up with his head resting on his knees. When we found him, he was lying flat on the bed, and as a consequence, he'd suffocated. Now, whether it was a deliberate act of suicide, or whether it was a pathetic attempt on his part to try to live some sort of a normal life and sleep like a normal human being, we will never know. But he was dead when we found him. and. Although it was tragic, and he'd made many friends while he was here at the London Hospital, I felt that we'd made the last few years of his life a little better than it would have been if he'd remained where he was. When John Merrick, the Elephant Man, died, he was thought to be a singular, hideous aberration of nature. Yet today, 100,000 people in the United States alone are victims of the Elephant Man disorder, neurofibromatosis. It is John Merrick's suffering that has called attention to their affliction, something society has tried to hide. How does anyone afflicted with this disorder cope with it today? The Elephant Man's disorder is discussed by Dr. Alan Rubenstein. John Merrick, who was the Elephant Man, had an extraordinary case of neurofibromatosis with extensive overgrowth of tissues surrounding the neurofibromas. He really represents one end of a wide spectrum of this disorder. The disorder can range from a benign syndrome in which only a few lesions are present to people who have more severe involvement of the skin and more seriously growths of deeper areas of the body, which can lead to blindness, deafness, and spinal cord uh, paralysis. Neurofibromatosis is not a rare disorder. The incidence is approximately 50 per 100,000, which means that 100,000 Americans are affected with this disorder. That makes it as common as muscular dystrophy or multiple sclerosis or other diseases which many people have heard of. I started to get panicked when I was about in my 20s, late 20s, and I suddenly realized that something wasn't quite right. Irene Smith has additional symptoms. Ptosis. And then I started to get falling about, losing my sense of balance. They x-rayed my head and they said I've got one growing on the eighth cranial nerve of the head, which is obviously going to throw me off my balance. And there's also one in my right ear. And that would also help me to lose my sense of balance. I never know I'm going to fall. I can be standing on the curb go to take a step forward and I'm flat on my face. When you go into a dress shop, you don't want the assistant in the cubicle with you. Say, no, thank you, I can manage on my own. Because you feel very embarrassed in case they think their dresses might be contaminated or something like that. 
I'm very careful how I choose my dresses. I always make sure that I never buy a sleeveless dress or a see-through blouse or anything with a plunging neckline. I always make sure that my arms are either half covered or fully covered if I can. It's not always possible to get the clothes that you want and I don't make my own clothes. Otherwise I would always make we go around dressed like a nun. <laughs> Just because that's how you feel that you want to cover yourself up as much as possible. This 58 year old man who demonstrates the most common lesion in neurofibromatosis which is the dermal neurofibroma. They are usually multiple more common on the torso and usually break the skin and uh, present as, uh, as multiple nodules which are usually painless. They can range in number from a few to literally thousands. These lesions are composed of nerve cells and fibrous tissue, hence the term neurofibroma. The disorder is genetic. It's a function of an abnormality in the chromosomes of an individual the precise location of the abnormality and how to identify it are as yet undetermined. Plastic surgery is a partial answer. Over the past several years, we've done dozens of surgical procedures in which patients under general anesthesia has extensive removal of his skin lesions. And the results in general have been quite good. I used to have many large ones, similar to those that I have on my body on my face. And the uh, foundation had a doctor, Simon, that, uh, a plastic surgeon, and he removed them and it really picked me up a lot, changed my attitude a lot. As a social worker, my primary concern is the impact... Penny Schwartz, Mount Sinai Hospital, New York. ...of a genetic neurological disorder on patients and families' lives. And one of the things that the NF patient family group tries to do is to provide an atmosphere to talk about how they feel. Do people ever say nasty things to no, you? No, nobody has ever said anything nasty to me, but I, I, I do know and that people just are continually staring and eventually, if the stare lasts for more than five or ten seconds, you eventually do feel extremely mm -hmm. self-conscious. I always had a very large, uh, big red floppy tumor on my left shoulder that I had had since birth and as I was growing older the tumor itself <clears throat> developed and grew and to that point I was very self-conscious about it and when I used to go to the beach or any other place like that during the summer where you could indeed go topless I would always be very conscious of that and wear a very dark shirt so that the tumor would not show through. My main area of frustration and concern is lack of knowledge on the part of physicians. Uh, I've known for some time what I have, but the physicians with whom I spoke and my family history all seemed to indicate that it was nothing more than neurofibromas.